Okay, uh, Gospel of Mark. Now, Jesus appears before the Sanhedrin. We looked at this last week in chapter 14, verses 53 to 65. And there he's judged guilty of blasphemy. Remember when Caiaphas jumps in and he's judged guilty based on what he says in response to Caiaphas. And he's judged guilty. He's then spit on. He's beaten and he's mocked. And then in 1466 to 72, Peter denies Jesus three times. And after his third denial, the rooster crows a second time, fulfilling the Lord's prediction in chapter 14, verse 30. And then Peter bursts into tears. And we go into chapter 15. The Sanhedrin, they, they had judged Jesus guilty of blasphemy and deserving of death, but as you know, Israel at that time was occupied. Israel was under the control of the Romans, and the Romans prohibited them from using the death penalty, from administering the death penalty, and you can see that in John chapter 18, verse 31. Now, Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, he says there was an exception to the Roman policy, that they would permit them to execute Gentiles who violated the temple. So when they went past, you remember the barrier we looked at says no Gentiles allowed, you go past this and you do so on penalty of death. So Josephus says that they allowed them to do that and they apparently were willing to look the other way during certain kinds of mob actions, particularly if they took place when Jerusalem wasn't packed with people, like the stoning of Stephen. You know, in Acts chapter 7, 58 to 60. But that's different from a legal execution where we go through process and we're going to, they would not allow them to execute people. Now that means, of course, then that the Sanhedrin had to get the Romans involved. If they're going to execute Jesus, they had to get the Roman governor to sentence Jesus to death. So the Sanhedrin discussed the matter before they transferred Jesus to Pilate because they have to get him to condemn him. Now at the time, Judea was an imperial province. The Roman Empire has different administrative districts. It's an imperial province that was administered by governors appointed by the Roman emperor. And, the, and Pontius Pilate, he was governor of Judea from AD 26 to AD 36, and his official title is prefect. That's his role, that's his official title. Now, he normally lived, he normally resided in Caesarea Maritima, Caesarea that was on the coast, not to be confused with Caesarea Philippi. Now, you can imagine, right, a, a political honcho, where is he going to stay? He's going to stay on the beach. Okay, so this is where, and that was the seat of the Roman government of Judea. So that's where he normally, he normally lived there. But during major festivals, he would take up temporary residence in Jerusalem to keep an eye on the crowds. I mean, you've got thousands and thousands of people packed into Jerusalem. And so he's not about to be that far away. So when they would have these major festivals, he would come and reside temporarily in Jerusalem. He probably stayed during those times in Herod's palace. And you can see Herod, right? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, by all means. Here, you take my place. So he said in the southwestern part of the city. Now, in 1961, a man named Antonio Frovo, he discovered in Caesarea Maritima an inscription in Latin mentioning Pontius Pilate. Now, of course, we know about Pilate from literary references. But here you have an archaeological artifact that has him mentioned. It's in an inscription. The left-hand side of the inscription, it had been chipped away, presumably to get that stone to fit better in some kind of secondary usage. You know, you've got a stone here, and I need a stone. I don't much care that the guy's got an inscription on it. I want to chip it away and get it to fit in what I want it to do. So that's presumably why it was chipped away like that. But the restoration of the second and third lines is clear. Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea. Now the entire inscription, it may have read to the people of Caesarea, 
Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judea, has given the Tiberium, which may have been a temple dedicated to the emperor Tiberius. So here we have this artifact that's discovered, and I just like to point out that kind of stuff to you. Now, Pilate asks Jesus if he's the king of the Jews. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, you have said so. As I mentioned last week in, in his response to Caiaphas, as reported in Matthew, that response being something like, yes, but in a sense that is beyond or not exactly what you envision in your question. You say, yes, but, you, but you're a little confused about what that means. So he, he definitely says, yes, he is. In other words, he is indeed the king of, Jew, of the Jews. But there's, in that affirmation, he's saying that, look, there's something to it that you don't understand. And you can see that, right? I mean, Pilate's thinking he's simply a typical worldly king. Well, Jesus is much more than that. You see, when he says, yes, I'm the king of the Jews, that's got history, baby. You know, I am the king of the Jews. I am the Messiah. I am the one that people have been waiting for. But you don't understand all that. So, yes, I'm the king of the Jews, but there's more to it than you grasp. Now, the ruling priests, the ruling priests were viewed by the Roman authorities as the official leadership of the Jewish nation. That's how they looked at him. And the ruling priest, they begin accusing Jesus of many things, which Mark doesn't specify. He doesn't spell out what they're accusing him of. And as reported in Luke 23, verse 2, these charges included that he opposed paying taxes to Caesar and that he claimed to be Messiah, a king. Now, Jesus didn't respond to these charges despite Pilate's invitation for him to do that. And Jesus just sits there mum, and Pilate is amazed. He's amazed in the sense he's baffled. His mind is blown by why somebody wouldn't put up a defense when his life was at stake. I mean, what kind of craziness is this? You've got people saying you're just not saying anything about it. It's almost like you don't care if you're going to be executed. So he, he winds up, he's confused by that. But Pilate, like the disciples, they didn't grasp that Jesus, he had chosen his path in fulfillment of God's purpose to deliver him over to suffering and death as a ransom for sin. And so this, so Pilate doesn't see that, doesn't understand that. So he's, he's amazed that Jesus is not defending himself against these charges. Now at the Passover festival, Pilate, he normally would release one prisoner at the request of the people. Now this presumably got started as a way to placate the Jewish crowds, as a way to kind of soften the anti-Roman sentiment of the crowd, right? I mean, you, you see him sitting here saying, well, look, you know, I'm not that bad of a guy. I'll, I'll throw you a bone. You guys just don't go crazy. So how it started, I don't know, but obviously here it is. He has this custom that he's doing. And at that time, there was a group of prisoners that was there awaiting trial for having participated in a rebellion in which one or more people had been murdered. So you have some prisoners here. Uh, they had participated in that rebellion. And among those prisoners was a high-profile person named Barabbas. And Mark Strauss comments in his commentary, he says, There were many opposition movements and violent demonstrations against the Romans in first century Palestine. These included both insurrectionist movements, those seeking to violently overthrow the government, and social banditry, disenfranchised peasants, who turned to robbery out of poverty and exploitation by the upper classes. Like first century Robin Hoods, these bandits tended to be popular with the common people who despised the Roman rulers and their wealthy countrymen who profited from the Roman rule. So you have both of these things going on. Whether rebel or robber or both, Barabbas was likely part of the broad movements 
of opposition to Roman authorities. The two robbers or bandits crucified with Jesus were probably part of this same rebellion and had been arrested with him, had been arrested with Barabbas. Now the crowd asked Pilate to release a prisoner as he normally did, and Pilate asked him if they want him to release the king of the Jews, meaning Jesus. Is that, that's who you want me to release? You want me to give you Jesus? And he knew the ruling priest that they had handed Jesus over out of envy. He was aware of that because they were threatened by Jesus' popularity. So he knew that. So he figured, he figured the crowd would want Jesus to be released. You see, so if the crowd says, hey, release Jesus, well, that would then give him political cover with the Jews for releasing somebody. They wanted him to execute, but he didn't want to execute in the first place. So he said, you want me to release Jesus, king of the Jews? And then he would have done that, you see. And that would give him political cover. He could say to the Jewish leaders, well, you want me to do that? You know, they, they wanted this. They, ah, but that didn't work out, did it? The ruling priests, what do they do? They smell this out. And they go around to the crowds and they persuade the crowds to ask for Barabbas' release. Now, this tells you something, doesn't it, about how people are? That you've got this group of people and you've got these religious leaders, relative handful of them, and what are they able to do? They're able to turn that crowd against Jesus. Manipulation of people, groups, you see, controlling powers, and they're able to do it. And so they get them, no, 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 we want, we want you to release Barabbas, because these, these Jewish leaders felt more threatened by Jesus than they felt threatened by a violent opponent of the prevailing social order. That was, you know, this, you have these people who are insurrectionists or social bandits, whatever it is, they're opposed, they're, they're up to burning the place down. And they were more threatened by Jesus. So they said, listen, no, you guys asked for Barabbas. And that's what they did. But if he releases Barabbas, Pilate asks, well, then what's he to do with Jesus? The one they call king of the Jews. And the crowd shouts back, crucify him. Wait a minute, if, if I release Barabbas, as you're saying, to, well, then what am I going to do with him? Well, what you're going to do with him is you're going to crucify him. And Pilate, he pushes back against that, asking why? What evil has he done? That he would merit crucifixion, but the crowd's not interested in debating the matter. They're not looking to, to have some kind of reasoned exchange about, well, now let me think about that. Mm, you're right, he really had not Now crucify him! They shout all the louder to crucify him. So Pilate, who is like most politicians, I would really, I think all politicians, but I'll, I'll say like most politicians, is a ruthless pragmatist. That's all he cares about, okay? He's a ruthless pragmatist who didn't want to rile the crowd. So, of course, he releases Barabbas to them, and after having Jesus scourged, which is a whipping that caused causes severe lacerations. If you saw the passion of, of the Christ, you have an idea of what's involved in that. That was well done. Because they take these whips, these leather thongs that have bone and metal in them, and they whip you. And these Roman guards, I mean, this is, you know, they, they seem, hey, what do we care? We're occupying you people. I'm away from home. I'm sitting here li living among you people I despise. So I get, a, I get some free shots at this guy. And so they have, Pilate has him scourged, which was this terrific uh, lacerations. And he delivers him to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. And as Mark Strauss remarks, it's a, it's, it is politically a double win to release Barabbas for the people and to crucify Jesus for the religious leaders. So you're thinking about, well, why didn't Pilate, if Pilate really thought justice, why Pilate doesn't care? <laughs> Pilate's a politician. What he wants is, I want my job secure. 
And I don't want any noise going back to Rome. So I'm trying to manage this thing. If I think that's the way to go, Barabbas it is, Jesus crucified, we good? All right, we're good. You know, that, that's, that's how it is. Now in 16 to 20, chapter 15, 16 to 20, having scourged Jesus, this brutal whipping, you know, and I remember that scene there after they've done this and they pull on him and just slide him in the blood. And so after this absolutely brutal whipping, the soldiers lead Jesus to the courtyard of Pilate's residence and they call together the whole cohort. Now, a cohort, as I mentioned, I think last week or two weeks ago, a cohort technically is 600 men. But the term could be used for a particular subset that was 200. And as Mark Strauss suggests, he says, Mark, quote, likely is using the term loosely to refer to the portion of the garrison on duty at the time. So it's the whole cohort that was there on duty, all of that cohort that was there. That makes sense to me. If you want to say, no, it has to be the whole cohort, okay. But I, it does make sense to me. You could refer to the whole court on duty and still speak of it that way. Now, the soldiers, they threw a cloth or a cloak on Jesus that was probably a faded scarlet military cloak. A faded scarlet military cloak. You see in Matthew 27, 28, refers to a scarlet robe. And this faded scarlet military cloak, it looked purple enough to mimic royalty. See, royalty wore purple. And here you have this military thing that's faded good enough. We're going to throw it on him because we're going to mock him as the king. We're going to make fun of this clown. This delusional guy who thinks he's king. And here we are treating him, just beating him to death. And he, think, he, he thinks he's a king, and he's got people who think he's a king. So they throw, this, they throw this on him, and they also twist together some thorns into a, into a wreath, and they address the Son of God mockingly with, Hail, King of the Jews! They're just mocking him, just treating him like, what a complete joke you are. They're treating the Son of God this way. They kept hitting him in the head with the reed or the staff that they had used as a mock scepter. You know, when they're joking, here he is, the king. Got a crown of thorns, his fake purple robe. We're putting this thing in his hand. They, kept, they, they beat him with that, and they continue spitting on him. And as I said, you know, uh, I don't know how this works for women, but for most men, you go up and spit in a man's face, and it's almost certainly on. Okay? That's like, uh, you know, you just, you do that. And that's like, you know, basically saying, uh, you're complete dirt. And I think of Jesus, perfect. You know? We could sit here and say, well, you're right, I deserve to be spit on. But he's perfect. And these people are spitting on him. Those he is going to save. Or at least die for. You see? And they're doing that. They spit on him, treating him like, like that. And kneeling, you know. They, and they kneel before him in this mocking homage, you know. As though he's a king. All in unknowing fulfillment of Isaiah 50, verse 6. Where he talks about him mocking him. You see, they didn't know that, but God knew it. God had revealed it centuries before that his son, the Messiah, would be treated this way. And this is what they're doing. And they think, they think they're in the driver's seat. They think they've got this guy. This guy's a clown. We're just going to brutalize him. And now, when they'd mocked him long enough, they removed the purple cloak, put his own clothes back on him, and they led him away to crucify him. Now, Roman sources indicate that those who were crucified, they typically traveled to the site of the crucifixion where the cross was naked. That was how it was typically done. So it's odd here that it's reported that they put Jesus' clothes back on him for that journey to the crucifixion site. Now, perhaps it was 
It was Roman deference to Jewish sensibilities about nakedness. In other words, maybe they had a policy that said, listen, these people really get excited about that kind of thing, and it's just not worth it to me. So don't do it. Okay? Maybe that's what's behind it. But when they, they, they had done that, and then they, they put the, his clothes back on him, and they lead him away. And then we see Jesus here is crucified in verses 21 to 32 of Mark 15. Now, victims of crucifixion, they commonly were required to carry the cross beam. Okay, the cross beam to the crucifixion site. The cross beam, the Latin phrase was a patibulum. And they were typically caused or required to carry that beam where it was then connected to the upright beam that remained at the crucifixion site. So we would have the upright beam there. The victim would be scourged. He would then carry the cross beam to the site. It would be attached to the upright piece, and then he would be affixed to that. Okay, so this is typically how they would operate. Now, the cross beam, it would have weighed 30 to 40 pounds. And we see here that at some point, the Roman soldiers, they compelled Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, that's just really interesting. Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry Jesus' cross. But we know John 19, 17, it says that Jesus was bearing his cross when he headed out for the crucifixion site. So presumably what happened is that he collapsed on the way and then Simon was conscripted to carry the cross. You know, the Roman soldiers would do this. They would just come and say, hey, it's like a cop wanting to commandeer your car or something like that. I'm in some kind of crisis situation. They would just grab Jews and say, you're going to do what I want. You know, for certain things. And this is one of them. They, they conscripted Simon to do this. Now, as I mentioned in the introduction, the identification of Simon of Cyrene in 5, 1521 as the father of Alexander and Rufus. You see, that indicates that the readers are familiar with Alexander and Rufus. I mean, why would you mention that? If I got no idea, you know, who Alexander and Rufus, why would you say... Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Somebody, I expect in my audience, knows Alexander and Rufus. Otherwise, the reference doesn't make any sense. So somebody knew about it, and it just so happens that a man named Rufus is mentioned in Romans chapter 16, verse 13, as being a member of the church in Rome which supports the idea that Mark wrote his gospel initially for Christians in Rome. So I mentioned that when we did the introduction. In 1941, 1941, Eliezer Sukenik and Naaman Avigad, they found a first century ossuary. Remember, that's a bone box. After the skin rots off, we put them in there. And as I said, this burial practice was used in Palestine for a relatively short period of time, just a century or a bit more. But they found this first century ossuary in the Kidron Valley, and its lid had the name Alexander inscribed in Greek and Alexander inscribed in Hebrew. But the Hebrew name was followed by what's probably an adjective form of Cyrene. In other words, Alexander the Cyrenite. So that's probably what that is. And it also had Alexander, son of Simon, also was written in Greek, in this green, chalky substance on the front, and it was scratched in the back. There was another ossuary, another bone box in that same tomb that said, Sarah, daughter of Simon of Ptolemaeus. And that's probably referring to Ptolemaeus in Cyrenica. Now, Jack Finnegan, who was at Princeton, in his book, Archaeology of the New Testament, he says, Thus we have here a family burial, at least to the extent of two children of a certain Simon, and their place of origin was probably Cyrene. From Acts 6, 9, we know that there was a synagogue of Cyrenians in Jerusalem, and in Mark 15, 21, it was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, who was compelled to carry the cross of Jesus. 
It is surely a real possibility that this unostentatious tomb was the last resting place of the bones of at least two members of the family of this very Simon. So I just like to bring these things out for you because to me it helps the reality. This is history, you see, and the image that our culture gives is, no, you just have people just making stuff up. No, that's not how it was. That's not how it was at all. Now, in, uh, they brought Jesus to a place, Mark says, to a place called Golgotha, okay, which is a modified version of the Aramaic word for skull. Okay, so there's an Aramaic word, skull, and it's essentially transliterated into Greek, Golgotha. And so that's what he says, this place of skull. Now, as Mark explains, it means place of a skull. Now, Calvary, that term Calvary, that comes, it's in Luke 23, 33, in the King James Version. Okay, and in the New King James continued that. But where does that come from? See, because in Luke 23, 33, what it says is place of a skull. But in Latin, place of a skull is calvarii locus. But it means place of a skull. But when the King James translated it, they took calvarii, skull, and they transliterated it to calvary. So that's where you get in Luke 23, 33, you get Calvary. Now, we don't know why it was called place of a skull or place of the skull. We don't know why that's the case. It may have been because it's where people were killed. It was a site where people were killed and skull simply functioned as a representation of death. Now, this place, it was outside the city walls. It was probably near major roads. You say, why do you think that? Well, the Romans liked to send a message to the populace with their crucifixions. They didn't go off and hide somewhere. They crucified somebody. They did it right out where everybody's going to see it. And the signal is, do you see what happens if you mess with us? So they, they liked to do this at these roads. And Golgotha probably was, was located in what's known today as the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. This is probably the site. It's in, in Jerusalem. And you can see here where you have the tomb and you have Calvary all within the confines of the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. And I think some of you have visited that church in Jerusalem. But the soldiers, they tried to give Jesus wine mixed with myrrh. They tried to do this, but he wouldn't take it. Now, it's sometimes suggested that myrrh would numb the pain of crucifixion. But there's little evidence that myrrh had that effect. And besides, it's very difficult to imagine these psychotic Roman soldiers caring one whit about the Lord's pain. It's very difficult to think that. They weren't concerned about easing his pain at all. Their offering him flavored wine seems much more likely to me and to many other people to be a continuation of their mocking of him. You see, fine wines in that day often were mixed with spices like myrrh. That was kind of considered a way to make them even more special. And so here they are, they're putting this myrrh in wine, and they're giving it to, to him along the lines, I think, of only the finest for you, O king. I think that's the sense of it. I think they're continuing their mocking of him. And Jesus' refusal to drink, it's probably because he refused to play along with their ongoing mockery. So that's what I think is happening there. And they crucified Jesus, which was the cruelest and most humiliating form of execution in the ancient world. I've said before, in our country, you typically have, if a state has a death penalty or the feds have a death penalty, you have a way of carrying out the death penalty whether it's gas chamber, whatever it is, injection. That's not how it was in the ancient world. They had different ways of killing you. And crucifixion was reserved for the lowest of the low. 
It was reserved for those people who were enemies of the state, slaves, people who were just classless or whatever. And so this is what they had it reserved for those kinds of people. The Roman orator, Cicero, he called cru- crucifixion the most cruel and disgusting penalty. The Jewish historian Josephus, who witnessed many crucifixions during Titus' siege of Rome in A.D. 70, he called crucifixion, quote, the most wretched of deaths, end quote. It was reserved, as I say, for the lower classes, for slaves, enemies of the state, the absolute worst criminals. So people who were being crucified were despised. It would be like if, we're, if you saved a certain penalty only for child rapists or something. Whoever's getting that penalty is looked at as, oh, this guy's the worst. You see, it carried with it an inherent shame. It carried an inherent shame. Now, in 63 B.C., okay, so we're obviously a good ways before the Lord here, 63 B.C., Rabirius, who was a Roman nobleman and a senator, he was threatened with the penalty of crucifixion. And in defending him, the Roman orator Cicero, he said, how grievous a thing it is to be disgraced by a public court. How grievous to suffer a fine. How grievous to suffer banishment. And yet in the midst of any such disaster, we retain some degree of liberty, even if we're threatened with death. We may die free men, but the very word cross should be far removed, not only from the person of a Roman citizen, but his thoughts, his eyes, and his ears. For it's not the actual occurrence of these things, but the very mention of them that's unworthy of a Roman citizen and a free man. So you see something of what is crucifixion. And so here is the Lord. He's not coming just to die. He's coming to die in the most shameful, horrible, despicable way that the ancient world had to offer. And it's this shame and humiliation of crucifixion that's in mind in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, where the writer says that Jesus endured the cross scorning its shame. Endured the cross, scorning its shame. And he says in 13.3, he speaks there of the disgrace Jesus bore. Well, he's being crucified. You see, he's being crucified and everybody, just like horrible. Now, the Romans had different ways of crucifying people. But most often, a cross beam was used. They could do X's. They had different ways of doing it. But typically a cross beam was used and it was put either on top of the stake like a T or was put down like we typically think of a cross. So it was done in either of those ways. And they would fasten the victim to the cross with either ropes or nails. And we know in the Lord's case it was with nails. And death would result from bleeding, trauma, and asphyxiation. So it's just a terrible way to die. That you just sit there and basically watch somebody over a prolonged period of time, having been scourged, just sit there and slowly and in agony expire. It's just brutal. Now the soldiers, they divided up Jesus' clothing. They're casting lots to see who would get what, right? I mean, they're saying, listen, this guy's going, we're taking his stuff. But they wanted to be among themselves and be like, well, who gets what? All right, flip a coin, you know, do odds or evens, whatever it is. They're casting lots to bring in some kind of thing like that that would allow them to accept the result that I get this and you don't. So this is what they're doing. Now, John specifies in his gospel in John 19, 24, that this was in fulfillment of Psalm 22, 18. They're casting lots. They think they're in control. They think they're doing it. God has told us this. This is what's happening. And there they are, you know, just thinking so much. They're in the catbird seat driving everything. And what they were doing was predicted. 
long before they did it. The Romans normally crucified people naked. It just adds to the shame and the humiliation. They normally did that naked, but they may, uh, they may have done that with Jesus. But given that their, their seeming sensitivity to Jewish sensibilities about nakedness and reclothing him on the way to the cross, it's possible that they allowed him to keep the loincloth on just because they didn't want to you know, stir people up more. But uh, it, it's just unclear. You don't know. Now, Mark 15, 25, it says that Jesus was crucified at the third hour. Whereas John 19, 14, identifies the time of his crucifixion as about the sixth hour. All right, well, as you imagine, uh, critics and unbelievers, they say, listen, obviously we have a contradiction here. One guy says third hour, one guy says sixth hour. So there you are. You see, Bible's messed up. Now, some claim it's a contradiction, but I think that's unduly skeptical. I think you're not being fair with how terms and things would have been used in the first century. You have to understand that first century Jews, they weren't nearly as time conscious as we are in the modern Western world, and sundials weren't in common use. So it's not like everybody's running around with a sundial on his wrist and what time is it? Well, I think it's about uh, 1030. That's not how it was done. You see, you had the daylight hours were busted up into 12 hours, and then you had three main points, third hour, sixth hour, and ninth hour. And those are basically references to mid-morning, midday, and mid-afternoon. That's what they stand for. The third hour is mid-morning. The twelfth hour, the sixth hour is midday. Twelfth hour, or ninth hour, I'm sorry, is, is mid-afternoon. So you see, there, there's a lot more play in those things. So let's say you say, well, he, he's crucified at the third hour, mid-morning. Well, what about if he's crucified as you get to the border between mid-morning and midday. Let's say 10.30. Well, would it, be, would it be off to say, one person looks at it and says, okay, he's crucified mid-morning, and the other person says he's crucified about midday. Well, I understand that. I understand that perfectly. So I just think that's a little hyper I understand if I was an atheist, I'd probably be riding that. But I just say, no, I think you're pushing a little too hard there because you have to understand how these things are used and what they mean. So if Jesus is crucified, as I say, I think that would fit and there's no problem with that. Uh, now, the written notice of the charge that is leveled against Jesus, Mark gives it to us as, he said, he, the written notice is, gives it to us as the king of the Jews. Okay, well, we learned from other gospels that it was fastened to the cross and that it was posted above the Lord's head. And the full notice that was put there seems to have been, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. That seems to have been the full notice that was there. And John in 19, 20, and 20, verses 20 and 21, he notes that this notice is written in three languages. Hebrew, or Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. So we have this thing posted in three different languages. Now, the, the various Gospels, they omit all or parts of the first clause. Okay, so it looks like the full, what was posted there is this is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Mark omits from that first clause of Nazareth. So he, just, he has, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Mark omits it all and just has the King of the Jews. Luke omits Jesus of Nazareth, and he has, this is the king of the Jews. And John omits, this is, and he has Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. Okay, that's another thing people want to park on and say, well, do you see here that they're, not, I'm just going, you know, come on. Uh, do I have to, when I'm giving this thing, do you think I'm, now if they had said when they wrote that, by the way, I'm giving you the absolute complete statement of what was there, well, then I'd understand it. But, you know, if, if I'm sitting here and I'm saying, look, what did the thing say? It said, this is Jesus, king of the Jews. No! Nah! It said, this is Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. All right, do you see how that's, that's hypercritical? 
in trying to judge, well, is, are these things consistent? Well, yes, they are consistent. Now, the two outlaws crucified with Jesus, they're probably insurrectionists who had been arrested with, uh, for rebellion and murder with Barabbas. So Barabbas dodged a bullet, and these are probably people who had been arrested with him. Now, Mark 15, 28, which cites Isaiah 53, 12, uh, which is a fulfillment formula. It says, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. That is omitted in most modern translations because it almost certainly was not part of the original text, but it was a scribal edition later based on Luke twenty two thirty seven. So I don't know if what your translation has, but many modern translations will just have the verse number and there won't be anything there. That's why. And that's not a problem. You see, it's textual criticism is trying to determine what is the original inspired writing? So if we have all these manuscripts and we see it's not there, and then we have some other manuscript and it's there, well, then we say, well, was this added where somebody thought that was in the original, they put it in? Okay, so textual criticism is nothing to be afraid of. It's trying to get down to what was the original uh, document. Now, those passing by the, uh, the public site of Jesus' crucifixion, what do they do? Well, they verbally abuse him, and they shake their heads as a sign of derision and contempt. Like, you know, just, you're just worthless. What a joke you are. This is what the people are doing to the Son of God. Just treating him like that. They're shaking their heads, and just as indicated in Psalm 22, 7. All right? They're just playing it out. And the people of Jerusalem, they've now turned against him. Remember when he came in? Yeah, here he comes. Son of David. Hosanna. Well, it didn't take long. What happened? Are they disappointed? Did they not like that he didn't come in and do what they wanted? And so now they've all turned against him. The whole city crucified, crucified. He's crucified, and now they're walking by just shaking their heads going, how absolutely ridiculous you are. Some mock him for allegedly claiming he was going to destroy and rebuild the temple in three days, and yet not being able to get himself down from the cross. Here you were talking so big. You led us to believe that you were the Messiah. You are going to do something. And they're angry at him because they don't understand. They don't understand. He's pouring his life out. Now, I'm thinking of you, you put yourself in Jesus' position. I hear that bell. Well, you are suffering what he's suffering and what he's going to suffer. And to have the very people for whom you are suffering shaking their heads at you and despising you. Oh, you know, I could just see myself just coming up in a complete rage. You see? Well, what's the Lord do? The Lord drinks the cup dry. He did it for me. He did it for you. Nobody like him. Praise him. Thanks for coming.